The main differentiator is the features. The perfect medium is that as a block builder, you attract enough user transaction flow, like origination. If you're also an OFA, you know that two seconds with the block auction left, you're not going to win the block. How do you then propagate that to other builders who are more likely to win? Setting up those order flow auctions for builders to want to connect to you, that medium is going to be run by the features. Scraping Bits is brought to you by the following sponsors. MEV Protocol. Maximize your ETH staking value with MEV ETH. Exclusively on MEV.io. And Composable. Execute any intent on any chain coming soon to Mantis.app. That's M-A-N-T-I-S dot A-double-P. And Fastlane Labs, the only MEV and intent-centric team that has a daily deodorant application rate of over 68%. GM, GM, everyone. My name's Tagachi, host of Scraping Bits. And today, I'm with Anurag. How's it going? Going well, bro. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for coming on. I'm excited to talk to you. You know, I don't know how we met, but probably just stumbled across each other on Twitter. Just for the people that aren't familiar with you, who are you and, and what do you do? Yeah, I'm currently working in the Mev space. I'm at Merkel right now. We're a MEV company building all sorts of cool things focused on order flow auctions and block building. But it's been a journey getting here. Tell me about the journey, man. I'm, I'm keen to hear about, you know, how does one get into a position like yours? And you do have like an interesting background as well. So what was it before crypto and getting into crypto and into the point where you are now? Yeah, for sure. A lot of my undergrad education was actually more in AI, the intersection of AI and finance. So I got into quant trading and more HFT system development and traditional finance. I didn't really pick up crypto until DeFi summer. And even then, it was more just as a hobby, thinking about the different things that were happening. Um, it was a crazy time back then with all the food coins and you know the master chefs with like those crazy APYs. Man, the good old days, you know? The good old days. But yeah, it wasn't until uh, I think like 21, I was working at Galaxy Digital doing high frequency market making on the dev side. And I spent my day working on that stuff. And then my evenings and nights kind of thinking about all things crypto. I mean, I was kind of fascinated with everything. Uh, I was reading DeFi and ZK, and, uh, scaling. Everything was super cool. What were you doing in Galaxy? Because I know, you know, getting to like a firm like that, it's not trivial. And you've got to have some pretty good skills to get into something like that kind of applied using some of my AT background. I had worked at Five Rings Capital, which is a US-based um, trading prop fund. And the team that I was working on, Galaxy, used to be their own prop fund that did market making across commodities and shifted into crypto back in 2014. That team was acquired by Galaxy and run all their centralized exchange high-frequency strategies. So it was something that I had previously worked on the dev side and so it fit really well. And I had a background in C++, so it, it was a good way for me to access crypto, but still apply what I had already done. And you just left off the acquisition or how long did you stay for and what, what happened after? No, so the prop fund is called Blue. It was acquired before I joined. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, I thought it got acquired. Oh, yeah. It was just a team at Galaxy that I was working with. Right, got you. Okay, interesting. And then what did you decide to do after since you're no longer there now? Yeah, my biggest thing was I wanted to get closer to the chain, do more crypto native stuff. Be more DGEN. Be more DGEN. Nice. All those eight tokens. <laughs> my first thing was I had to get comfortable with the development of blockchains. So I started um, coding with tutorials and all the open source stuff that was out. And actually, MEV was my first exposure to it. Like the very first thing outside of tutorials that I ever built was this really simple, stupid MEV bot. But I really love that way of getting into crypto because you have to understand everything in order to do it, right? You have to understand the protocol, the smart contracting, the networking layer and the data layer and build good data collection and monitoring tools. I also just find it fun. I mean, it's a, it's a PvP game, right? And you do well, you would win some money, which is awesome. So it's good reason to stick with it and try to improve. Oh, yeah, definitely. But how yeah, does, how does I, this kind of evolve? 
you you were doing like that that shitty little bot to begin with, but how did it evolve? Yeah, I started in Ethereum and like testing on like, Polygon and cheaper EVM chains. But it was very clear to me that it was, I mean, this was late 21. So the market was already really saturated with good web searchers. So at the time, hot topic was Solana, which was really putting forth Rust, right? Like the entire ecosystem is written in Rust. So I started looking at it, trying to learn Rust and the MEV space in Solana was like just maturing. So a good friend of mine at the time, we decided to go do this and we started writing MEV bots on Solana. We probably did that for about a year and we had some decent success on Solana arbitrage. But the brunt of that was in 2022. So it was a tough year. I mean, by the end of the year, there was next to nothing happening on chain. So we were ended up kind of closing stuff down. How is the uh, kind of collaboration like? Because I remember trying to do that a couple of times and I don't know if I'm just bad at collaborating or it just kind of didn't work out with these people, but it was an interesting thing. Yeah, I think I was super lucky. The guy I was working with was one of my best friends from college and we were both getting into crypto at the same time. So it was, I, I didn't really need to go out and look for someone. We yeah. were always kind of in it together. I mean, yeah. What were like interesting things you saw in Solana? You know, obviously doing it for a year, there's got to be some more stories. It's interesting. I don't know if I have more stories in the in the same way that some Ethereum searchers do. A big problem is that Solana's historical state access is a big problem. So it's really hard to monitor like the PVP arena. If you think about it, Solana does what, like two terabytes a year. Uh, Ethereum is uh, closer to, I think, 100 gigabytes, maybe a little more. But validators only hold a few days of history at the node. So it's 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 really tough. Like the resources necessary to do a proper archival node and serve state from far in the past is an incredible problem. And some of the biggest Solana based tech company tech protocols have tried and decided that it wasn't worth it. It's definitely the the limit of what we do see is the monitoring tools we have built and we can see when the few bots that we're like competing against are actively trying to arb the same pools that we're looking at or if we were for some reason further in the block we know that we were a few seconds behind and um that's a point of improvement i think the coolest story though i think is luna we were trying to deploy a second version of our bot and we hadn't fully finished it when luna happened and everything was crashing and by the time we got it up to running this was like we caught the tailwind of it and it was day three day four i think and we had like 24 hours where our new bot was doing super well and then like a month of nothing <laughs> damn how well was it doing though during those times i mean it would have been giant it was doing well we were definitely happy we could pay rent with it but it was uh if we had started like a year before i think early fall of 22 we knew, we knew searchers at the time that were doing like four four or five figures a day which is nuts like by the time we kind of got into it and we're like optimizing our bots it was nowhere near that mm. man how come you didn't just go to stay on ethereum <laughs> over to solana man i mean i both me and my friend were we were really into rust we wanted to learn learn about it and we also the Solana virtual machine is incredible. Like it's a great piece of code, the Solana client. We've learned a lot just reading that code base. And I mean, at the time it was like really, really popular, right? Like well, with the NFTs and everything, there it had a lot of traction behind it. I'm still a long term, long term bull Solana. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I the reason I didn't get into Solana was just because I felt like learning an entire new ecosystem and language not necessarily rust but like how you write in in i guess solana's language in rust it didn't make sense to me to learn if i was like super bullish on you know ethereum like why would i learn solana if i could learn solidity and the opcodes there when and you know, even the nodes right like it was all in in geef that client um that node basically and so everyone was forking that when they were making their own like l1 alternatives like Phantom, Avax, all that stuff, they would all fork like the ETH node, right? And it would all be a kind of modification of the EV, 
yeah, EVM, they would add like an opcode or a few at most, but everything else would really be agnostic in some way. Obviously, they'll change consensus, et cetera, but it just felt like a way bigger upside to learn that one thing. I think especially in the early days of learning versus like learning, I guess, the Solana ecosystem. Because like, let's say Solana goes down or it just, you know, it has no more, I guess, money inflow kind of going around, mm-hmm. then you're kind of stuck. You're, you're back at square one. Whereas if you were on like Phantom, for example, and that went to zero, then you could still jump to other chains. And ultimately like Ethereum, you know, I guess the birth of it all. That was my kind of reasoning behind it. That's a very fair take. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's no easy feat though, learning a massive code base and like all the infrastructure behind it. So what, what were your kind of uh, strategies for learning this this big ecosystem and kind of getting into into the game of it? Yeah, I think it was mostly just open source tools. There was no like real guide or courses that you can take, which is very much true for a lot of crypto. So we we just read the client code base a lot. And there were some tools that Solana had published. Did you have any like specific, I guess, or like decisions on what to learn before another? Because obviously you have this giant code base, right? So how do you decide what to learn first and go to the next part? We we started with Rust. It was a new language for us. So trying to get as comfortable with that was our primary goal. And then once we started looking at actually trying to create the bot, it was how do you, how do you, how, how does all the protocols work? One of the cool things about Solana is that it has Serum and now like Phoenix and OpenBook, but they have on chain order books, which function very differently than AMMs on Ethereum. So understanding how they're actually doing matching and uh, how execution occurs and how AMMs fit together. With the order books was a big thing we learned. Like, for example, Radium, which is a big AMM on Solana, it's a pseudo AMM where it has in house AMM pools, but routes orders through the underlying order book when the price you can execute better on the underlying book, which is super cool because it actually maximizes your price discovery. In when you're trading small amounts with the AMM, but in large amounts, it optimizes through the book. Some of those discrepancies were stuff we had to definitely learn before trying to build the bot. What was it like transitioning into Ethereum? Did you like know Solidity and stuff before, or did you have to relearn it all? And what was the kind of process into transitioning into ETH from Solana? I definitely needed a refresher. Before Solana, I had only... I, I would say a very brief glance at Solidity and how Ethereum functions. So I definitely needed a good month of reading and getting back into. I mean, that one year was also a year, right? Things can look very different in a year. So it was also kind of catching up on all the proposals that had happened in that time and what the current state of the art of searching or the tools that existed. The I I remember at the time when you were deploying contracts, you were using like Truffle. And oh, yeah. That. When I made the shift back, I actually started with uh, some of Paradigm's tools like uh, Foundry and Anvil, which I love today. They're, they're like pioneers basically in the tooling space. I think without Foundry, it would be a completely different place to what it is now, which is crazy to say that like one piece of software can really dictate the future of an entire space. So it just shows how early we are, to be honest. Even though the impact was giant, surely you can do anything, like build anything in any industry. But I think the impact in, in this industry right now is way bigger than anything else. That you really can, you know, move the needle a whole lot more if you were in like let's say web two cybersecurity. Yeah, we just don't have the decades of thought and reiteration, right? We're yeah. just figuring a lot of this stuff out. Yeah, I mean, definitely. DeFi primitives are less than uh, a cycle away, right? Yeah. And did you start doing searching on ETH or did you just join Merkle at that point? Um, when we shifted out of Solana, I started looking a little bit on Ethereum and L2s, more non atomic stuff, so less MEV and more like cross domain sat ARB and some 
more complicated assets like options and pool tokens and wrapped assets. But there, there's a lot of challenges with that that I was mulling over. In order to do that, we decided we had we needed to kind of do a ground up rewrite of our bot into a more full fledged trading system because the execution is very similar to how an HFT farm would trade. It's also extremely capital intensive, right? If you're doing cross domain, then you need inventory of different assets on different chains, maybe centralized, decentralized, and that's a legal and a business problem. So I spent some time learning about some of the new protocols and trying out strategies, but eventually was bought over by block building and order flow auctions. Hmm. Yeah, let's stick on the statistical op for a second. How did you really do that as a, a a duo? You know, like you still you needed a lot of capital, right, to do that, and you even had to take on a lot more risk than Atomic because you're holding a token. So, man, how what does that? Pro- yeah, hundred percent. Because I don't think a lot of people really do non Atomic, well, at least as duos or solo searches. Yeah, that was basically our conclusion. <laughs> we, we definitely <laughs> kept it very simple in that we were only really trading like a token or uh, two tokens at a time, mostly stables and keep a little bit in uh, either soul, whichever um, chains we were looking at. And it was more a test trial, like a proof of concept, if we could build a strategy that would work. Also did some like time-based set art. So instead of cross domain, it was single domain, um, like buy and sell over a period of a few blocks. So that was a uh, less entry exposure. When you think about Statub, you you think about someone like Jared, which is holding a shitcoin Pepe and then just makes hundreds of thousands of dollars in a couple days or weeks. So how come you didn't go the full degen route of buying random shitcoins? You know, I may have ended up there, bro. I, I, I think I was just... <laughs> it's all a cover-up. You are Jared. There was a point. <laughs> I wish. Um, no, no. I, th- I think... Uh, my my research into block building and OFAs kind of took it for me. Uh, I think that that was just so much more exciting to work on. Um, yeah, I think a, yeah. a big trend right now for searches is transitioning into block building. They've all kind of figured out or realized that it is quite similar, but I think a lot more brutal because obviously you have a, a whole bunch of transactions in the mempool you can apply your strategy to and maybe someone will pick up you know, a transaction that you wanted, but there might be some leftovers, right? But in block building, it's only, it's only one block, you know, and it's only one person that's going to get it. So it's a bit, it's way more cut for it in, in that sense. So what was the decision making behind that? And how did you really get into it? Yeah, the way I saw it, I think block builders, when this entity, block builder entity kind of came up, it's it opens up an aspect of MEV that was not directly accessible before. If you go back to some of Flashbot's original definitions of MEV, you have like transaction insertion, which is the ability of like putting in your own transactions, transaction reordering, which at the transaction layer, the Flashbot's auction can achieve to some extent because of bundles, but you can play gas games to do to get your spot in the block. But to have full control over ordering was up to the miners, right? And there was social and economic conventions for them not to do anything like that. But with the block builder, you have open control and it's anyone can try and build strategies around it. So that aspect of MEV being approachable is was super interesting to me. But I think the, the block builder is more than just like a MEV problem, right? Like obviously you have to be really good at extracting extracting value, but it's also a big business problem because at the end of the day, the, I think one of the biggest deciders is going to be order flow. And that's not really something you can sit in front of your laptop and code, right? You have to go out yeah. and make... It's networking. And, uh, it's networking. networking and so it's a lot of like yep. backdoor, I guess, deals, right? The builder would make friendships with searchers, like the t- best searchers, right? And then even would make friends with other builders on different chains to achieve cross-chain, right? So it's it's really transitioned from you know, a solo thing to an actual, well, business. It's monopoly kind of. You just make business relationships and you you both mutually benefit from it. So, And I think that's kind of difficult for most people to make friendships because a lot of searchers are very, don't want to speak to anyone, but obviously they'll want to speak to a builder if they're profiting even more. But then you have these siloed order flows of one builder having specific, you know, searcher. For example, let's just say like 
Jared was doing was sending his bun his bundles basically just to Beaver Build. And so that's a massive, you know, amount of water flow that's just leaving. And it's like a massive right. edge for the builder, right? Right. Right. And so what do you think of, of like the order flow kind of problem and how valuable do you think it is? And yeah, that's just like a it's just a big advantage actually that isn't coding problem. Yeah. I mean, we see it in traditional finance, right? The payment for order flow is a very sophisticated business. And the fact that we're seeing it in crypto is expected. I think that we're only about six months into researching it. I think there's a lot of solutions out there and a lot of different ways you can think about order flow. It's a little different, right? Because it's in TradFi, order flow is exclusive to trades. but in block building it's not right transactions that are not swaps or yeah it's everything are still valuable so my take on it is that there we need a way to find price discovery for every single transaction and that goes above and beyond just got like base and priority fees of the transaction but it's the value that it's actually creating on the chain and that needs to be instead of extracted by middlemen like searchers and builders and validators should kind of go to the both ends of that supply chain. I think uh, users should benefit from the value that they're creating and validators should get that for securing the network. I wish it wasn't, there wasn't exclusive order flow and I wish it was just all public mempool, no private stuff. I think it would be a much better place like that. It would just really drive innovation and in a competitive landscape. You know, if, if you want to, yeah, be but then you wouldn't need block builders, right? The entire um, reason that we need Mev Boost and any of these auction mechanisms is because uh, that that's not true. <laughs> I mean, at minimum, it would be nice to have a public mempool, though. <laughs> Just uh, you know, true. not everyone's <laughs> sending to private. I think there are some downsides to it, as in like hacks. If you're you know a sophisticated hacker. Not even sophisticated, but just someone that's not naive and actually knows about the landscape. I mean, you'll just send it to a private mempool, right? You do a $600 million hack. Yeah, imagine if the Ronin bridge was just like... Oh, I don't know how the Ronin bridge was actually hacked, though. Let's say something like Pickle. If that was just done you know, through private mempool or any on-chain one, you know, it's just all guaranteed. Unless there's some kind of censorship, but there is no censorship. And I think it would make sandwiching a lot less viable as well i don't know if you saw sandwiching right. solana man it just seems like not feasible really so to do sandwiching. it's extremely extremely hard because they're pre gito there was no way to really do it gito is like flashbots esque sidecar to solana um so you can send bundles to um gito um but it was it's never it was never as big as, as ethereum yeah and flashbots is I mean, it definitely helps, helped a lot of searches, but I guess there's trade-offs for everything, you know? Um, yeah. I think the democratization of it is also a real value. It's hard to measure, but when you allow open and free competition, and that's also a very loaded word, right? A lot of this stuff in reality is super centralized, which oh, yeah. we don't assume, <laughs> but if you remove that assumption, <laughs> the ability for anyone to go in and access, it's helpful, right? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. the deeper you go into it all, it's really just centralized. The only decentralized thing is the ledger, really. It's all like, you know, set up the AWS across the world, build all, all your infrastructure, make exclusive deals, and all ran by like a small amount of people. Like when you look at the block builders, it's just, you know, Titan, Beaver, and Rsync, and that's really it. It's just those three. Yeah, if like we built a monitoring tool at Merkle and... uh Hmm. I wrote a blog post about this recently, but I think it was like 95% of Met, 90, 90 or 95% of MetBoost blocks are controlled by those three builders, yeah. which is <laughs> ridiculous. Like three, there's like three algos run by maybe a cumulative of 30 to 50 people control a total of 90% of Ethereum's block space. <laughs> yeah, it's insane, right? It's pretty insane. And you know, you're doing block building at Merkle as well, aren't you? So how are you going to compete with these, these guys? Like what, what are the really the chances and what's really needed to get to that point of being competitive? Because, you know, there's so many searchers getting into block building now. So not only are you competing with the big three, 
but you're also competing with all the influx of searches transitioning into building. So, man, how do you do it? Yeah, 100%. I think it's not, I don't see there being, I, I think it's really hard for there to be 100 good builders right and yeah, there's just course. too much network dynamics in terms of order flow that would make that unlikely i think a lot of these searcher teams that are transitioning into block building is i think they'll try it and the ones that are successful on uh, business side will succeed if not then it's worth it for them to cut losses and just partner with the builder that's good so i don't know how much of them will actually succeed but i think the The ones that do win, first, the ability to extract MEV is absolutely essential, right? Uh, Like in a non-malicious way, the whether you insource it or outsource it to other searchers or you're doing it yourself, and both atomic and signal driven, so like traditional MEV or like Sextax ARB, all that value needs to be, you need to be able to build it. The second point is obviously optimized systems, the teams that can actually build do the build as efficiently as possible with creative algorithms is also going to win. But I think the main differentiator that we'll start to see over the next year is the features, right? Like the perfect medium of all of this is that you have you as a block builder, you attract enough user transaction flow, like origination, you attract enough searchers to want to send it to you. And that goes above and beyond market share, in my opinion. I think it really touches on the features that you're offering. So why why this builder over a different builder? And if you're also an OFA, if you're maybe maybe you know that two seconds with the block auction left, you're not going to win the block. How do you then propagate that to other builders who are more likely to win? Setting up those order flow auctions for builders to want to connect to you. That medium, I think, is going to be run by the features that you're able to offer. And what would be like an example feature for, let's say, I build a builder and you're competing with me? What what would be a, an example of a feature? Because you see majority, like Tyson and Rsync, they're both neutral builders. I don't know, I guess, the features that differentiate them, but that's kind of what they're known for, being neutral. But yeah, how would you gain an edge in that sense? Yeah, I think we honestly haven't seen any cool features yet. I think all most of the major builders are they're still on the focusing on MEV stage, in my opinion. So like for example, if you look at relays, the ultrasound came up with optimistic relaying, which is where you don't wait for verification before your bids are processed by the relay. Your block bids are processed by the relay, which is super cool because now you can send you the latency required to actually timestamp your block bid is a lot lower that I think can be done at the block builder layer. Maybe you can do optimistic bundles, right? Where you don't need to verify. You assume assume bundles execute properly and maybe you custody some funds to make sure that's actually true. I'm mm-hmm. also really interested in maybe partial block auctions where you can sell rights to a chunk, but not singular transactions, mm-hmm. which would give which would give value to transactions that don't have uh traditional mouth that you can extract um, yeah selling off partial blocks would be quite interesting imagine just buying a block and kind of like a let's say half of a block and saving it for the future and you can come make even more mev it's actually like the perfect opportunity but i think that would be interesting because like a user would be expecting you know their transaction be sent like you're saying a bull market right and there's a massive dump or pump and someone wants to get in early or trying to sell before it like crashed to zero and you see like the sentiment on twitter right and so that everybody's trying to like get in let's say to the shit coin and they don't want to wait let's say that the transaction gets put into like this partial block that will be used later so now they've just lost the opportunity and you know it's and then it reverts i guess because the price is different all that stuff so i'm pretty keen to see what happens next i think the things that people are doing like fast lane and flashbots with, with Suave and yeah, fast lane with Atlas is going to be interesting. Even composable with a cross chain IBC, there's a whole lot of cool innovations happening. It's just kind of waiting to see who really brings the entire market to them. So keen. yeah, you're absolutely right. I think we're still trying to figure out which method works 
and which uh, actually achieves the goals we're looking at. And it's not an easy problem. You're looking at a lot of different things. And uh, I, th- I think that's the most exciting part of this is that you're, it's not just about the map anymore. It's a, there's a lot of different components that you're thinking about and trying to innovate on top of. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, you guys at Merkel don't just do block building. Um, you do way more as well. You're obviously every block build has their own, I guess, place you can send the transactions to. Um, and you guys are doing that as well. And you've also got some interesting things as well with a it's kind of Uniswap X vibe of an order book. And you can kind of just like true like basically bid on this stuff and people will fill it in. So another type of MEV. I think uh Aori. Aori? Aori. I can't say their name. Are doing the kind of same thing. Um but yeah, there's, there's yeah. a lot of stuff happening. Yeah, we're I know the block builder is uh, just one of our verticals that we um, have been spending a lot of time on the last few months. But um, we we also operate a private pool, um, which is similar to MevShare in that we offer like sandwich protection, front run protection uh, for transactions, which is a um, one version of the OFA. Um, we also do, like you said, the you know, Swap X style. Um, RFQ routing, so searchers can come in to execute users' trades and pay back MEV rebates um, all atomically, which um, which I think is going to be the next, the go-to way trades are settled um, on Ethereum going forward. Uh, another cool thing we've been working on is a transaction stream. So like similar to Impura or Blockstrout, we're building an in-house like geolocated stream that uh, to get you transactions as fast as possible. And we actually just got that working on Polygon and VSC too. Um, so that should be live in the next couple of weeks, which we're super excited for. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, we also built a Telegram bot um, going on top of some of these other uh, bots out there. Uh, mostly we found that most DGENs just love sniping tokens, so we kind of optimized for that um, and uh, have all sorts of cool features built on top of it. But we uh, we created this atomic sniper where uh, we bundle a bunch of snipes into a mega back run to optimize the bid to profit uh, for users, which is really cool. Um, we still need to see it in action, but theoretically it's super cool for us web nerds. Um, but yeah, and then we got the builder, um, and recently, so a lot of uh, the builder and a lot of our other products that we're looking at are built on Rust and uh, built on top of uh, Rep, like the Paradigm open source uh, execution client. We recently opened up a free RPC endpoint that we're um, just open sourcing at eatmerkle.io. It's super cool, so um, people can just use it. That's serviced by a cluster of ret nodes that we spun up and are mm-hmm. working Is this with. just for uh, Ethereum or other chains as well? So currently just Ethereum. Um, we're working internally to get it to work on other chains, but we're a little ways away from that. <laughs> um, we also recently open sourced a endpoint for ret snapshots. So like, for example, it takes two to three days to sync a execution client get or uh, ret is a little faster um, and uh, the size of the database is a lot smaller but it still takes a little while to fully sync so you can use our snapshot endpoint to just download a very recent snapshot and just run your uh, ret node from there so like i tested it last week and it, it it's like under five hours end to end to get a completely synced rest node up so that's no. super cool too yeah it takes i mean imagine like one of your nodes just like get corrupted and you have to re redo it and just sync it all it just takes ages so snapshots is really good it just sounds like you're doing so much man so how do you juggle it all then if there's so many things that are going on how do you prioritize and manage your time to you know first of all learn outside of work, but also, you know, making good progress in all these different fields, unless you just focus on one at a time and still at, at, at that, yeah. still hard, you know? I mean, it's lucky. I think we have six people at Merkle, really good engineers. We're all, most of us were searchers in the past life and we were kind of each focused on our own little vertical. There's a couple of us working on the builder right now and 
the transaction stream, which is still in development, which we built after the MedBar of Keep system. So some of them are kind of uh, built and we just need to launch and um, get users in front of, and some of them we're actively working on. So it's definitely fast moving. I'm extremely surprised at how much we've built in the last few months alone. When we talk about private pools and sending your transactions to a specific RPC, why would someone send it to your pool over like, let's say Flashbots as a private mempool? Yeah, so like, let's say you offer front run protection, and that's the main reason why you want to send it to a private pool in the first place. Then the difference between private pools is just what you're offering. So the offer that Flashbots gives you is that if you send it to Flashbots Protect, it will allow its vast number of searchers to actually execute and return any. MEV that is generated, which is their selling point in that they have a lot of searchers connected to them. One thing we're trialing is we actually return a fixed fee for all transactions. So we pay for any transaction that we receive in our private pool, we pay for it. So you get a fixed fee no matter what transaction it is and a percentage of the MEV that is executed. So try in a different style, see, see if it works. And this is on Ethereum as well? This is on Ethereum. We also run the private pool on Polygon and BSC, but it's uh, they're the like MEVUST type solutions on both of those ecosystems are still super naive. So we're kind of like working with them to figure out how it'll come to effect. Yeah, I think I saw the fee is like guaranteed two cents yeah. or something. That wouldn't even be able to cover one transaction in <laughs> Ethereum, I think. I was doing transactions the other day, losing my entire life savings in a shitcoin, and that was costing me sixty dollars to lose it all. I mean, the goal is not to like pay the gas fees of the transaction. I, that would be that. It's not really the purpose of it. But uh, our clients, we are going after like RPC providers because they are a big uh, source of transactions, and for them, it makes a huge difference because they get a percentage of fees and are able to monetize their flow in a way that they couldn't before. Oh, okay, so the more people they get into your thing, they get like a little fee, basically. Exactly. Uh, okay. Like I, if you go to a quick node, you can select on any of your RPC nodes to enable uh, like Merkle Protect. Oh, okay. I thought it was like 2%. I mean, like 2 cents to the user doing the transaction. Oh, okay. No, so I guess our client right now is RPC, but the goal is to create ways for the RPC to then like either add more features down downstream to users or even offer like a, a rebate on their RPC subscription if they're using. So you're basically like kind of paying for transactions in some way. I thought it was like a, I honestly thought it was like a mockery of like someone, you know, losing <laughs> their entire life savings on a shitcoin trade and you pay them like two cents is like, good job. No, nah, that's definitely, uh, we're trying Genius to- marketing. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, the idea is, that the searchers connected would also, like, if there was MEV, that the searchers would create rebates that would also go back to the, I mean, that, that, that's part of it. We just want to guarantee a fixed price that we're paying for at the bottom. And any MEV that we can and will extract in the future will also add on top of it. You know, but if there is an order book, right, then they see it. Unless they're confined somehow to the execution, couldn't they just, like, put in their own transactions and sandwich it? inside the order book anyway or the which order book the uniswap x filler kind of thing you guys have oh rfq my oh, 100 no, yeah. right, right, right. yeah those are two separate products so like the private pool let's just think about as transactions that we know of today you know so uh, yeah okay the, yeah the, got you. Got you. The rfq is more like you sign up to our platform and you can execute trades through our ui or through our developer api and those trades, either custodied or not, we then fill through MEV. It's a little different execution process. Okay. Oh, you guys are the only ones filling the RFQ, the request for quote? Currently, yes, but we will be outsourcing it too. Mm. And, you know, it, the point is to outsource. It. Yeah, yeah, got you. You know, I, I think order books are interesting. The whole Uniswap X kind of deal and just order books in general, if you're a filler, you see these pending transactions, you know, waiting to be filled and you are the filler, right? And you can basically put in 
your own transactions into the order book as well to kind of sandwich it and then execute all of them in like sequ- sequential order, right? It's, I feel like that's a possible thing and it can, it probably will happen. Yeah, it right. depends on how the RFQ is implemented, right? Like what ours is doing is basically a contract that allows for settlement to happen. So it do, it's not a, uh, it does the matching logic outside of execution. So that it wouldn't be possible to get a transaction. Like we couldn't insert a transaction between the buy and the fill because it's packaged into the transaction. But I'm sure there are, like MevShare, if Flashbots was devious and they technically could put their own transactions in between the searcher and the, and the user. Just different forms of how the RFQ is implemented. Mm. And man, I, I feel like when you think about builders as well, just to like skip back to the builder kind of topic, is when you initially think about a builder coming from like a cyber background at least and building a fuzzer it feels like it is just a fuzzing problem but obviously you can enhance the fuzzer to make it more intelligent create heuristics to fuzz specific things or other others and prioritize different transactions over others but in my mind it really just is a fuzzing problem you have a set of transactions and you just order them in specific ways to obtain the best block but you know which will be you know most profitable and that's the initial thought, but obviously you can enhance it a lot more with, you know, heuristics. Maybe there is a different kind of way, but from what I understand, it really is just that. And, you know, if you're thinking about fuzzing at that point, you could really like, why wouldn't you build an AI on top of that then? If, you know, if the fuzzing works then you would learn from the fuzzing of what specific features would actually be the most important to order above others or below others and what to really look out for. For example, you know, like a swap that would change the pool and I don't know, maybe nobody's actually grabbing that that MEV. So you could do like a back run after maybe chaining a bunch of these and do like one one giant arb at the end of the block if nobody else is doing it. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean the basic block building um, problem is it's it's a known computer science problem, right? It's called the knapsack problem and how you solve the best block given a set of weighted transactions weighted by the fees that they're paying. The point that arises is, okay, now you can create transactions, but like, how do you create those transactions? And yeah, there's infinite space, right? And like perfect search over your entire state space, and that's impossible to do, right? So you have to be more targeted with it. But yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting problem. I think we're just starting to see some more interest i think like build build ai claims that they have an ai that builds their blocks so i don't think that's open source is it uh i don't know but they're not doing too well at building though i haven't heard, heard i don't know how, how well yeah you know, good that ai is then i think they were saying that their ai performed the backgrounds on their flow or something like that hmm but we definitely could see AI being used for oh, 100%. Uh, prediction or like trying to identify where value could be extracted. So you could do more targeted extraction or like you can like limit what you're actually searching for, stuff like that, or predicting future state given like maybe you look at a Aave liquidation and you expect certain things to happen in the future and that could lead to certain math in some way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, research would be really cool to look at. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I think AI. It, it's a difficult. It's an interesting thing though because it's like two domains intertwining. So you've got to be pretty good at one, of, well, both of them to really capture the opportunity that is at the intersection of you know both of them as well. And obviously, when you're good at one niche, but then also have to get good at another niche, that really filters out the competition. Now you're left with a very small, I guess, set of people that can really capitalize on the opportunity. Um, and it's also interesting that like MEV is really like a cyber security tooling problem as well. If you think about, you know, the search space and decision making of how do you decide that this, uh, I'm thinking more in like a generalized sense, by the way, not just like targeting. How do you make the decision that this function or this transaction and from like, you know, user A interacting with protocol A is being combined with like, transaction 76 from whatever user that is from whatever protocol that is how can these interact with each other it really does sound like a a cyber problem so 
And then you can enhance it, I think, with, with AI, which is honestly why I'm learning AI. I think there's a lot of potential there. And when you think about being able to learn as well from, from the past, it just makes sense because then you're really just limited to your own intuition being pushed into a program. It's kind of like when you use a hammer, you're using your will to hit the nail, but with the hammer. And it's kind of the same. You're using your brain or well, using the keyboard to push your will into the, in, into the software. But I think there definitely is a lot of interesting things to come in the future. I think a lot of people are using AI for like transaction hack detection. I think BlockSec actually just released their thing today as of like 15th November. Don't know when I'm going to release this, but then that, I think that uses AI and it's been, man, it found like 15 mil in six months. I prevented 15 mil. So I think it was the first actual detection system in crypto that's working, which is crazy. And it's only going to get yeah, more 100%. competitive over time. Um, yeah, I think you got to find your areas where the problem is not very deterministic. I think MEV, in, as a definition, is fairly deterministic. But something like trying to figure out if a contract is malicious is very much not a straightforward question. Finding ways to... The problems require agencies is interesting. I think it's quite similar, though, because when you think about MEV and, I guess, cyber... It's the combination of, you know, features to achieve a certain goal, which is maximum money. And that's a shared goal between MEV and exploits. It's a, how much money can I get out of a spin from a protocol or a transaction? How can I combine them in, in, in different ways? So, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely fair. You can take like a generic approach to it and just be like, okay, here's a DeFi protocol or here's two DeFi protocols and create an environment where you're trying to like optimize any possible transaction that could do something with these two protocols that creates value. That'd be a good, interesting way of putting it, right? Could definitely train something. Yeah, I'm super bullish on uh, generalized versions of things and intelligence in whatever, I guess, realm it is. It doesn't have to be like fully generalized intelligence where it's like something competing against humans, but you know, in, in its own little field, right? Like specialized right. intelligence, but in, in some ways. But man, I'm super keen to see the future of, you know, crypto and, and your career as well. We're both like very early in our careers. And uh, it's very, we'll, we'll probably look back at this time and, and we'll be very proud or cringing very hard. It's definitely one or the other. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Mixture of both. <laughs> but man, it's been such a pleasure uh, getting to know over the past few days and I'm very keen to see how everything plays out. Thank you so much for jumping on. I appreciate your time. Definitely. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed talking with you. And we'll see where this goes. I'm excited. Yeah. Can't wait to cringe in the future. All right, man. Take care. Thanks for jumping on.